a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Parsi A Parsi or Parsi refers to a member of the Zoroastrian community who migrated to India from Persia during the Arab invasion of 636-651 AD. One of two mainly located in India, with a few in Pakistan. According to the Kiswai Sanjan, Parsis migrated from Greater Iran to Gujarat, where they were given refuge, between the 8th and 10th century AD to avoid persecution following the Muslim conquest of Persia. At the time of the Muslim conquest of Persia, the dominant religion of the region was Zoroastrianism. Iranians rebelled against Muslim conquerors for almost 200 years. During this time many Iranians chose to preserve their religious identity by fleeing from Iran to India. The word, pronounced, Persian, i.e., Parsi, in the Persian language, literally means Persian. Farsi is the official language of modern Iran, which was formerly known as Persia, and the Persian language's endonym is Farsi, an Arabization of the word Parsi. The long presence of the Parsis in the Indian subcontinent distinguishes them from the smaller Zoroastrian Indian community of Iranis, who are much more recent arrivals. Mostly descended from Zoroastrians fleeing the repression of the Qajar dynasty and the general social and political tumult of late 19th and early 20th century Iran. Definition and Identity According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Parsi, also spelled Parsi, member of a group of followers in India of the Persian prophet Zoroaster. The Parsis, whose name means, Persians, are descended from Persian Zoroastrians who emigrated to India to avoid religious persecution by the Muslims. They live chiefly in Mumbai and in a few towns and villages mostly to the south of Mumbai, but also a few minorities nearby in Karachi and Bangalore. There is a sizable Parsi population in Pune as well in Hyderabad. A few Parsi families also reside in Kolkata and Chennai, although they are not, strictly speaking, a caste. Since they are not Hindus, they form a well-defined community. The exact date of the Parsi migration is unknown. According to tradition, the Parsis initially settled at Hormuz on the Persian Gulf, but finding themselves still persecuted they set sail for India, arriving in the 8th century. The migration may in fact have taken place as late as the 10th century, or in both. They settled first at Dewan Yavar, but soon moved to South Gujarat where they remained for about 800 years as a small agricultural community. The term Parsi, which in the Persian language is a demonym meaning, inhabitant of Pars, and hence, ethnic Persian, is not attested in Indian Zoroastrian texts until the 17th century. Until that time, such texts consistently use the Persian origin terms Zatoshti, Zoroastrian, or Vedin, of, the good religion, the 12th century 16 shlokas, a Sanskrit text in praise of the Parsis, is the earliest attested use of the term as an identifier for Indian Zoroastrians. The first reference to the Parsis in a European language is from 1322, when a French monk, Jordanus, briefly refers to their presence in Thane and Baruch. Subsequently, the term appears in the journals of many European travelers, first French and Portuguese, later English, all of whom used a Europeanized version of an apparently local language term. For example, Portuguese physician Garcia de Orto observed in 1563 that, there are merchants, in the kingdom of Cambaya, known as Esparsi. We Portuguese call them Jews, but they are not so. They are gentios. In an early 20th century legal ruling, Justices de Var and Beeman asserted that, Parsi, was also a term used in Iran to refer to Zoroastrians. Notes that in much the same way as the word, Hindu, was used by Iranians to refer to anyone from the Indian subcontinent, Parsi, was used by the Indians to refer to anyone from Greater Iran, irrespective of whether they were actually ethnic Persian people. In any case, the term, Parsi, itself is, not necessarily an indication of their Iranian or Persian origin but rather as indicate a manifest as several properties of ethnic identity. Moreover, if heredity were the only factor in a determination of ethnicity, the Parsis would count as Parthians according to the Kisai Sanjan. The term, Parsiism, or, Parsiism, is attributed to Abraham Hyacinth Ankatil du Peran, 
who in the 1750s, when the word Zoroastrianism had yet to be coined, made the first detailed report of the Parsis and of Zoroastrianism. Therein mistakenly assuming that the Parsis were the only remaining followers of the religion. In addition to above, the Parsi identity was well truly an identity even before they moved to India. Origins In ancient Persia, Zoroaster taught that good and evil were opposite forces and the battle between them is more or less evenly matched. A person should always be vigilant to align with forces of light. According to the Asher or the righteousness and Druj or the wickedness, the person has chosen in his life they will be judged at the Chinvat bridge to grant passage to paradise, Hamistagan or hell by a sword. A personified form of the soul that represents the person's deeds takes the adjudge to their destination and they will abide there until the final apocalypse. After the final battle between good and evil, Every souls walk through a river of fire ordeal for burning of their dross and together they receive a post-resurrection paradise. The Zoroastrian holy book, called the Avesta, was written in the Avestan language, which is closely related to Vedic Sanskrit. The Kisui Sanjan is a tale of the journey of the Parsis to India from Iran. It says they fled for reasons of religious freedom, and they were allowed to settle in India thanks to the goodwill of a local prince. However, the Parsi community had to abide by three rules. They had to speak the local language, follow local marriage customs, and not carry any weapons. After showing the many similarities between their faith and local beliefs, the early community was granted a plot of land on which to build a fire temple. As an ethnic community, over the centuries since the first Zoroastrians arrived in India, the Parsis have integrated themselves into Indian society while simultaneously maintaining or developing their own distinct customs and traditions. This in turn has given the Parsi community a rather peculiar standing. They are Indians in terms of national affiliation, language and history, but not typically Indian in terms of consanguinity or ethnicity, cultural, behavioral and religious practices. Genealogical DNA tests to determine purity of lineage have brought mixed results. One study supports the Parsi contention that they have maintained their Persian roots by avoiding intermarriage with local populations. In that 2002 study of the Y chromosome DNA of the Parsis of Pakistan, it was determined that Parsis are genetically closer to Iranians than to their neighbors. A 2004 study in which Parsi mitochondrial DNA was compared with that of the Iranians and Gujaratis determined that Parsis are genetically closer to Gujaratis than to Iranians. Taking the 2002 study into account, the authors of the 2004 study suggested a male-mediated migration of the ancestors of the present-day Parsi population, where they had mixed with local females, leading ultimately to the loss of Mtna of Iranian origin. To put all the doubts to rest a deeper study was conducted in 2017, like sugar in milk, reconstructing the genetic history of the Parsi population which confirms that Parsis are genetically closer to Neolithic Iranians than to modern Iranians, who have witnessed a more recent wave of admixture from the Near East. Self-perceptions The definition of who is, and is not, a Parsi is a matter of great contention within the Zoroastrian community in India. It is generally accepted that a Parsi is a person who is directly descended from the original Persian refugees, and, has been formally admitted into the Zoroastrian religion, through the Nave Jot ceremony. In this sense, Parsi is an ethno-religious designator, whose definition is of contention among its members, similar to the contention over who is a Jew in the West. Some members of the community additionally contend that a child must have a Parsi father to be eligible for introduction into the faith. But this assertion is considered by most to be a violation of the Zoroastrian tenets of gender equality and may be a remnant of an old legal definition of the term Parsi. An oft-quoted legal definition of Parsi is based on a 1909 ruling that not only stipulated that a person could not become a Parsi by converting to the Zoroastrian faith, but also noted, this definition was overturned several times. The equality principles of the Indian constitution void the patrilineal restrictions expressed in the third clause. The second clause was contested and overturned in 1948. On appeal in 1950, the 1948 ruling was upheld and the entire 1909 definition was deemed an obiter dictum a collateral opinion and not legally binding.
Nonetheless, the opinion that the 1909 ruling is legally binding continues to persist, even among the better read and moderate parties. Population According to the 2011 Census of India, there are 57,264 Parsis in India. According to the National Commission for Minorities, there are a variety of causes that are responsible for this steady decline in the population of the community, the most significant of which were childlessness and migration. Demographic Trends project that by the year 2020 the Parsis will number only 23,000. The Parsis will then cease to be called a community and will be labeled a tribe. One-fifth of the decrease in population is attributed to migration. A slower birth rate than death rate accounts for the rest. As of 2001, Parsis over the age of 60 make up for 31% of the community. Only 4.7% of the Parsi community are under 6 years of age, which translates to 7 births per year per 1,000 individuals. Concerns have been raised in recent years over the rapidly declining population of the Parsi community in India. Other demographic statistics The gender ratio among Parsis is unusual. As of 2001, the ratio of males to females was 1,000 males to 1,050 females, due primarily to the high median age of the population. As of 2001 the national average in India was 1,000 males to 933 females. Parsis have a high literacy rate. As of 2001, the literacy rate is 97.9%, the highest of any Indian community. 96.1% of Parsis reside in urban areas. In the Greater Mumbai area, where the density of Parsis is highest, about 10% of Parsi females and about 20% of Parsi males do not marry. Arrival in the Indian Subcontinent According to the Kiswai Sanjan, the only existing account of the early years of Zoroastrian refugees in India composed at least six centuries after their tentative date of arrival. The first group of immigrants originated from Greater Khorasan. This historical region of Central Asia is in part in northeastern Iran, where it constitutes modern Khorasan province, part of western slash northern Afghanistan and in part in three Central Asian republics namely Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. According to the Kisa, the immigrants were granted permission to stay by the local ruler, Jadi Rana, on the condition that they adopt the local language and that their women adopt local dress. The refugees accepted the conditions and founded the settlement of Sanjan, which is said to have been named after the city of their origin. This first group was followed by a second group from Greater Khorasan within five years of the first, and this time having religious implements with them. In addition to these Khrasanis or Khoistanis, mountain folk, as the two initial groups are said to have been initially called, at least one other group is said to have come overland from Sari, Iran. Although the Sanjan group are believed to have been the first permanent settlers, the precise date of their arrival is a matter of conjecture. All estimates are based on the Kissa, which is vague, or contradictory with respect to some elapsed periods. Consequently, three possible dates 716, 765, and 936 have been proposed as the year of landing, and the disagreement has been the cause of many an intense battle amongst Parsis. Since dates are not specifically mentioned in Parsi texts prior to the 18th century, any date of arrival is perforce a matter of speculation. The importance of the Kisa lies in any case not so much in its reconstruction of events than in its depiction of the Parsis in the way they have come to view themselves, and in their relationship to the dominant culture. As such, the text plays a crucial role in shaping Parsi identity. But, even if one comes to the conclusion that the chronicle based on verbal transmission is not more than a legend, it still remains without doubt an extremely informative document for Parsi historiography. The Sanjan Zoroastrians were certainly not the first Zoroastrians on the subcontinent. Sintuching Balochistan, the easternmost periphery of the Iranian world, too had once been under coastal administration of the Sasanian Empire, which consequently maintained outposts there, even following the loss of Sindh. The Iranians continued to play a major role in the trade links between the East and West. 
The 9th century Arab historiographer Al Masudi briefly notes Zoroastrians with fire temples in Al Hind and in Al Sind. There is evidence of individual Parsis residing in Sindh in the 10th and 12th centuries, but the current modern community is thought to date from British arrival in Sindh. Moreover, for the Iranians, the harbors of Gujarat lay on the maritime routes that complemented the overland Silk Road and there were extensive trade relations between the two regions. The contact between Iranians and Indians was already well established even prior to the Common Era, and both the Paanas and the Mahabharata use the term Parasikas to refer to the peoples west of the Indus River. Parsi legends regarding their ancestors' migration to India depict a beleaguered band of religious refugees escaping the new rule post the Muslim conquests in order to preserve their ancient faith. However, while Parsi settlements definitely arose along the western coast of the Indian subcontinent following the Arab conquest of Iran, it is not possible to state with certainty that these migrations occurred as a result of religious persecution against Zoroastrians. If the traditional 8th century date is considered valid, it must be assumed that the migration began while Zoroastrianism was still the predominant religion in Iran, and economic factors predominated the initial decision to migrate. This would have been particularly the case if as the Kissa suggests the first Parsis originally came from the northeast and had previously been dependent on Silk Road trade. Even so, in the 17th century, Henry Lord, a chaplain with the British East India Company, noted that the Parsis came to India seeking liberty of conscience, but simultaneously arrived as merchantmen bound for the shores of India, in course of trade, and merchandise. The fact that Muslims charged non-Muslims higher duties when trading from Muslim-held ports may be interpreted to be a form of religious persecution. But this being the only reason to migrate appears unlikely. Early Years The Kissa has little to say about the events that followed the establishment of Sanjan, and restricts itself to a brief note on the establishment of the Fire of Victory at Sanjan and its subsequent move to Navsari. According to Dala, the next several centuries were full of hardships before Zoroastrianism gained a real foothold in India and secured for its adherents some means of livelihood in this new country of their adoption. Two centuries after their landing, the Parsis began to settle in other parts of Gujarat, which led to difficulties in defining the limits of priestly jurisdiction. These problems were resolved by 1290 through the division of Gujarat into five Panthaks, each under the jurisdiction of one priestly family, and their descendants. Inscriptions at the Kanheri Caves near Mumbai suggest that at least until the early 11th century, Middle Persian was still the literary language of the hereditary Zoroastrian priesthood. Nonetheless, aside from the Kissa and the Kanheri inscriptions, there is little evidence of the Parsis until the 12th and 13th century, when, masterly, Sanskrit translations and transcriptions of the Avesta and its commentaries began to be prepared. From these translations Dala infers that, religious studies were prosecuted with great zeal at this period, and that the command of Middle Persian and Sanskrit among the clerics was of a superior order. From the 13th century to the late 16th century, the Zoroastrian priests of Gujarat sent 22 requests for religious guidance to their co-religionists in Iran, presumably because they considered the Iranian Zoroastrians better informed on religious matters than themselves, and must have preserved the old-time tradition more faithfully than they themselves did. These transmissions and their replies are assiduously preserved by the community as the rivayats span the years 1478. 1766 and deal with both religious and social subjects. From a superficial 21st century point of view, some of these ithata are remarkably trivial for instance, River Yat 376, whether ink prepared by a non-Zoroastrian is suitable for copying of Western language texts, but they provide a discerning insight into the fears and anxieties of the early modern Zoroastrians. Thus, the question of the ink is symptomatic of the fear of assimilation and the loss of identity, a theme that dominates the questions posed and continues to be an issue into the 21st century. So also the question of conversion of Juddins to Zoroastrianism, to which the reply was acceptable, even meritorious. Nonetheless, 
The precarious condition in which they lived for a considerable period made it impracticable for them to keep up their former proselytizing zeal. The instinctive fear of disintegration and absorption in the vast multitudes among whom they lived created in them a spirit of exclusiveness and a strong desire to preserve the racial characteristics and distinctive features of their community. Living in an atmosphere surcharged with the Hindu caste system, they felt that their own safety lay in encircling their fold by rigid caste barriers. Even so, at some point, the Zoroastrians perhaps determining that the social stratification that they had brought with them was unsustainable and the small community did away with all, but the hereditary priesthood. The remaining estates the Atheishtiri, Vast Arayoshi, Hutuksha were folded into an all-comprehensive class today known as the Bhatini. This change would have far-reaching consequences. For one, it opened the gene pool to some extent since until that time inter-class marriages were exceedingly rare. For another, it did away with the boundaries along occupational lines, a factor that would endear the Parsis to the 18th and 19th century British colonial authorities who had little patience for the unpredictable complications of the Hindu caste system. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries Would you like to know more?